This is Legislative Review on Prairie Public. I'm Dave Thompson. Thanks for joining us. Our guest today is the Senate Majority Leader, Senator Rich Wardner from Dickinson. Senator, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Dave. This has been one of the more interesting weeks of this session so far because you have a new revenue forecast. Uh, yes, we do. Um, you know, really, before we could move on, we had to adjust our numbers because everybody knew that the the numbers that were in the governor's original budget were uh, too high, especially based on the price of oil. And I know you had to adjust things downward. At first blush, it looks kind of intimidating, not for necessarily for the current biennium, which is down about $130 million in the general fund, but to have oil prices or oil price revenue about in half of where it was projected, it seems a little daunting at first blush, but as you and uh, the House Majority Leader said, the sky is not falling. It isn't, and you need to remember that many of the funds that are constitutional funds that receive money from that oil extraction tax, which is really the one that gets hit the hardest, and we don't spend the legacy, so it doesn't affect our general fund. And the Common Schools Trust, the Foundation Aid Stabilization Fund, those are all constitutional funds where they don't really affect the general fund. Now, we do have some funds we do spend. Resources Trust Fund will be cut more than half next biennium. And for those that don't know, Dave, that Resources Trust Fund is the fund that funds water projects, water systems uh, across the state of North Dakota. And of course, we've gotten kind of used to getting 700 million to 800 million, and we're going to be down at about 350 million. So we're going to have to cut back on some of the uh, projects and not do as much work this coming biennium as we had originally thought, because that money uh, we we spend it as it comes in over the biennium. We do not have it in hand going into the next biennium. Okay, so there, there might be some projects that may be put on the shelf temporarily, delayed a few years, whatever. Well, I would say they probably won't uh, put them on the shelf. They, you know, we got mature uh, systems like Southwest Water, uh, the Western Area Water Systems. They just won't get as much money as they thought they were going to get a month ago. But in terms of the general fund, you know, being the general fund, if I remember correctly, the revenues are down about $500 million from the projection. That's right. Going into next biennium, they are. And that is significant. And we will have to take a real good look at ongoing spending to make sure that we can sustain it. But there will be some of the one-time spending. There's some general fund dollars that are one-time spending. It will take probably the biggest share of the cuts. So it seems like one-time spending is where the area that's going to be hit the hardest. Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, in terms of the projections, though, because oil is a commodity, commodities are volatile, like agriculture is a commodity, commodities are, uh, are a little bit volatile, uh, this could turn around very quickly, too. It could. And... Uh, Nobody really knows, and there's a lot of speculation. Some seem to think that maybe in six months you might see a change where it will start going up. Others say, no, it's going to be more like a year and a half. So uh, we just have to ride this thing out. And we're very fortunate that we have money in places that uh, allows us kind of a soft landing. It is a lot different than it was, in, say, in the 1980s, where um, after Measure 6 was passed, when oil prices went south, if you want to put it that way, uh, the governor actually had to use his allocation powers and cut education sp spending and some other spending, and that, that hurt. Yes, and I, I would, by the way, I was teaching back then, and I remember how it affected the school that I was teaching in, and we had to make cuts. And... And that's what they had to do. They, and remember, back in the late 80s, they had raised taxes. And then it was referred, and those income taxes were lowered. And then the sales tax, if you recall, back then it was 5.5 cents or 5.5 percent. And when they, when they put it on the ballot, they took it from, and they, it was proposed to go to 6 
they took it all the way back to five was where we are today. So they didn't go back to the five and a half where it was, they went all the way back. And so that, that caused the state to really have to tighten up the budgets. And that was about shortly after that, I came into the North Dakota House of Representatives. Yeah. And I bring that up because it's a different landscape today that as you <clears throat> and uh, Representative Carlson pointed out at the, at the news conference, North Dakota's economy is in better shape these days. It is. The, we have other things that are keeping us going. And of course, the general fund is driven by sales tax. And as you know, uh, that's going to take a little bit of a hit because we say that every rig that's drilling out there, when they drill a well, it's $250,000 in sales tax. And we're going to miss that because there is definitely going to be a slowing of the drilling and a reduction in the real drills, drilling rigs out there. If if things would continue the way they are, when you're looking ahead to 1517, or the 19, uh, the 2017 session, it, could you be ratcheting back some of the general fund spending? I I would we would have two years to take a good look at it and and get ready, but I would see us making some cuts in general fund spending, and I would like to point out that if, if it stays like this, there won't be any money in the strategic investment and infrastructure fund to do what we did today when we sent that surge money out of the Senate for Western North Dakota. That won't be there. The one that I really worry about is that we have this property tax reduction fund or relief fund, which really is used for education. You know, the 125 mills that we've taken over from local school districts, we have to fund that. And uh, we probably would have to tap in, and this is a good thing, the interest from the legacy fund coming in would have to help us out there so we could sustain that to K through 12 education. And that's the insurance policy almost. It is, it yes, way. it is. And since you brought up the surge bill, I wanted to get into that very briefly. That, that that was one of the big priorities, to get that money for infrastructure development out to the western North Dakota area, out to the oil patch, as soon as possible, and one hurdle was crossed today. Yes, we were able to pass it in the, uh, in the Senate today. It uh, passed, I believe it was uh, 44 to 2. There was one member of the Senate missing. And uh, the two that voted against it, I understand their concerns. They... They didn't vote against it because they thought they don't need the money out there. They felt that there was a lot of money to be sending out there. But that uh, strategic investment and infrastructure fund is for that. And uh, to me, that is a top priority. We need to get uh, the people out there, the projects, the infrastructure out west to a point where they can kind of breathe again. And this is probably a good time, Dave, because there's a downturn or a correction out there that's going on, and they will be able to get these uh, projects done probably a little cheaper than they would normally because there's going to be labor available. Uh, contractors are going to be a little more hungry than they have been in the past, and so the dollar will go a lot further than it has in the past out in the oil patch. Plus the odd uh, circumstance that fuel prices are down. Fuel prices are down, and believe it or not, we are starting to see apartments open in Dickinson. Now that's interesting that that, that happened because when, when the boom really hit, that was one of the things people were talking about. Rents went way up. You couldn't find places to rent. You couldn't find places to stay in Dickinson, Watford City, Williston, all across the oil patch. Now it's starting to ease up a bit. It is, and so there are some good things. And so we'll see how it uh, plays out over here and how long, but I would tend to think that uh, the average rents are going to come down some. How much, I don't know. We will still have to continue to promote the housing incentive fund where we put money out. It's kind of gap funding to help uh, build homes that are have affordable rents for those people that uh, don't have the means to uh, pay those high rents. Now, there was money for that fund and some other things in what was called the Jumpstart Bill, but the Jumpstart Bill was killed in the Senate. 
Can you explain the thinking behind what's going to happen there? Well, we've talked to the agencies involved in, for example, the housing and uh, finance, which has the uh, housing incentive fund. We're going to put it in their budget, but we're going to move it as quickly as can and put an emergency clause on it. So as soon as that it gets signed, they will be out there and they'll be available. It might not go as quickly as the surge. However, I think the surge will have will be in the house for a while. So I don't think it's going to go as fast as some people think. Then there was also money, a uh, million dollars, for the uh, attorney general to do early hirings for uh, uh, agents out in the patch, which we th which is very important to us, and also the health department who had two million for early 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 hirings out in the patch to for uh, inspectors pipeline inspectors for uh, all kinds of environmental reasons to be out there but we're, we're putting them in the in their budgets and putting emergency clauses on them to get them out as quickly as possible and just so our everybody knows an emergency clause takes a two-thirds vote and if the emergency clause is put on, then you don't have to wait till August 1st. That's right. As soon as the governor signs the bill, it's, a, it's in effect. And there doesn't seem to be any opposition to spending money on the health department or the attorney general or on human trafficking, th you know, prevention and enforcement and some of these other things, the housing incentive fund. There doesn't seem to be a lot of opposition to that. It's just how you handle it. What might and, be the best way? And that's correct. And I also also like to point out that in the uh, budgets, we still have to deal with salaries and stuff like that. And so there's some things that they really can't do any hiring until they know the salaries. And that's that'll be in the budget. So we're going to work to to get them out. That is absolutely correct. Nobody is against them. It's just a matter of how we're handling it to get it out. And the other thing is. We didn't want too many things in that surge bill. It has enough things in it already. You start complicating it even more, it could uh, cause the bill to have some issues. So it would be a fair to statement to say that the surge bill was p particularly and really almost limited to infrastructure projects. Yeah, that is correct, Dave. So that's roads and bridges and perhaps, you know, four-laning and what they call truck reliever routes, what we used to call a bypass routes. Absolutely, and, and I want to tell you that we had money last session that went out for state highways and uh, for the reliever routes. And right now, Watford City, um, Alexander, Newtown, they all have the routes going around, and it is fantastic. It has changed the quality of life in those communities. Williston will have theirs shortly after we get into the construction season this summer. That, from what I'm hearing from my contacts in Williston, that's going to make a huge difference. It will, it will. Does it, as a leader of a caucus, does this whole uh, budget uncertainty, does that make your job harder? It, it does, but what you do is you do a lot of educating and you do a lot of uh, talking to the fiscal analysts up in Legislative Council and to OMB and uh, tax department, but you keep uh, informing people and educating them as to what's going on. But I want you to know I also have an ace in the hole, Ray Holmberg. I have one of the best appropriations chairman that you could have, and uh, um, he's a wizard. <laughs> That's what I don't know what else to say, but he does a great job. So you've got the right people in the right places. You know what? I. I have to say that this particular uh, session, I am very pleased with the committees, and they seem to complement each other. Everybody is working hard, uh, both the uh, minority and the majority party seem to fit. And so I feel very good about uh, the uh, committees and the committee assignments that we put together before the session. So that was probably one of the most important things I did. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because they're really, and, and it's early in the session, so they're, but so far there hasn't seemed to be any real partisan dust up you know, on the Senate floor. No, uh, and I guess we have a philosophy. We, we want to treat people with respect, and uh, we feel that the 
Uh, minority party has a role to play. We think they need to know. We don't sneak around behind them. We, we try to let them know what's going on. And you know what? They let us know what, what's going on too. And so right now we have a real healthy relationship. Now we know we're going to have differences of opinion. We had it on the floor today. Sure. But we still respect each other. And, uh, and I think that makes for good, solid legislation. In other words, your philosophy is everybody's got ideas. They're worth hearing. You may not agree, but you can do it respectfully. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to get into one, one subject since you brought up other committees. Judiciary has spent an entire day, basically, except for the floor session, looking at the whole human trafficking issue. And since you're very close to that, uh, what is your thought about what's going to come out of the session regarding human trafficking? Well, Dave, there's a lot of bills in on human trafficking, and they're going to hear them all, and I think they're going to be putting together one or two bills that encompasses what we want, that we can put an end to this and put some teeth into legislation and the law on human trafficking. It's a, it's a despicable thing, and uh, we want to do everything we can to protect our citizens and any citizen that comes from any other state into here that is expected to participate in that. I assume you've had some discussions with Dickinson Police, especially, and maybe Stark County Sheriff, about what they're seeing. Absolutely, and, and, and they've seen it. And uh, I would have to say that uh, they're aware of a lot of situations that they're investigating and have an ongoing uh, case where they're watching. And what they're always looking for is the higher echelon people that are really pulling the strings. And it's not only human trafficking, but it's also drugs and other issues that we have to deal with. You know, along with prosperity comes some of these unwanted elements that we have to deal with. And so we're hoping that during this uh, correction or slowdown that we can uh, put a dent in some of this crime that's out there. It's funny that when you mention that, it just comes to mind that the boom happened so, f it, it seemed to be happening so fast that a lot of these um, situations kind of got away from everybody and it's nobody's fault. It's just the speed of things. Well, that's right. You know, when it started out, it just started ramping up and people were focused on other things. I mean, they were focused on trying to get to work on, uh, on those highways and, and we you know, they're way improved over they were at the beginning. And then all of a sudden, the, this unwanted element that sells drugs and stuff creeped into the community, and before you knew it, they were there. You also have a, a pipeline bill that you've introduced, a pipeline uh, regulation, if we want to put it that way, uh, determining on safety of pipelines. Can you explain what, what your intent is on that? Well, it's pretty simple. We, we need to do something about these pipeline spills. We, and, you know, the oil spills are one thing. You can clean them up. Uh, we don't particularly like the one that uh, broke and spilled oil into the uh, Yellowstone River because that's a little bit more difficult. But the ones that are really are those salt water spills. They are devastating and when they, when that spills on the ground it kills everything and it kills it for a long period of time and nobody wants that. And so we need to do a better job or have more inspectors or whatever it may be and we have to do something to make sure we don't have these spills uh, and pipeline breaks that we have been experiencing here as of late. When you and I talked about that earlier uh, mm -hmm. you said you had a little a few concerns about some of the technology things that were in the bill you said there's new and better technology perhaps on its way. Well we that's what we hear uh, and we really hope there is you know they they talk, you know, we in the bill, it talks about uh, flow uh, meters and sh automatic shutoff valves. Well, those things have been present on some of the pipes that, where we've had some spills and it didn't help. So there's a lot of cost to putting them on. But you know what? We're going to try to find the latest uh, up-to-date technology and, and get it on. And if that's what it is, you know, it's probably better than nothing, but we have to, we have to look, look at that so that uh, industry has some flexibility to put 
the latest and the best quality uh, safety guards on these pipelines. Overall, are you happy with the way the state's been handling the regulation of the pipelines? Well, uh, I would like, to, I think you need a few more people. That's what I think. Uh, uh, I think they're doing the best they can with what they have. So do I think it uh, should be handled uh, a little better than it is? Yes, but I'm not going to throw stones because we're the ones that uh, appropriate the FTEs to get it done. So I think we need to get some more FTEs out there in the health department and the Department of Mineral Resources. And there are proposals to do that. There are, and of course, in at a time when we're going to have less money to deal with. So that is going to make some real interesting decisions that we're going to have to make in appropriations. That, as I said, it's not, not easy because there was an awful lot of money at least projected, and now, then the oil price went south, going back to that, and maybe you're going to have to ratchet back some of the FTEs. Uh, I would say we might have to ratchet back the, the number that we're going to, you know, the increase. We'll have to, right. instead of 14, we maybe can only do 8 or 9. But I would, we will probably do something like this, that if the price of oil comes back during the course of the interim and you have uh, your overestimate by a certain percentage, we might say, well, then we're going to trigger so couple more FTEs in a certain area. Will you be using some trigger mechanisms in budgets and things like that just in case revenues are better than forecast? I think we will. Uh, I, I will be definitely looking at them, contingencies and stuff like that. So uh, it'll be a, it'll be a definitely on the table and it'll be definitely something that we'll be looking at in each budget and each situation as we go along. So in the few minutes we have left, are there other issues we should be that you're watching very carefully, um, maybe not necessarily fiscal issues, but maybe policy issues? Well, I, you know, there's one issue that I think that uh, affects all of us, and that's mental health. And we're having a real hard time finding people just to be providers in mental health. Mental health is an issue for everybody across the state. And out west, our law enforcement spend a lot of time uh, transporting people to facilities, whether it be a, uh, a holding cell because uh, they're full or whether it be to a bed in a, uh, a mental health uh, institution. But that might have a cost at attached to it as well. Yeah, that will have a cost, uh, absolutely. But we can't do I mean, we're spending a lot of money now at the county level to, uh, transporting these people. That. Also, you know, the counties have gone to the leg coming to legislature again to have the state take over some of the other social service costs. Do you have an opinion on that particular bill? Well, I, you know, I do. I think we should do it. I think whatever we can do to help the local, well, first of all, it's to help the property uh, taxpayer, but more than that, to streamline the services in human services because. A lot of the things that the counties do are mandated by the federal government, and the state is just playing the facilitator. Uh, and then it goes on down to the counties. So I, I think that uh, if we put them under the state and uh, we take care of it, I think we can do a better job. Now, the counties are very concerned. They want some flexibility. In terms of... Well, if they need, if they happen to need another FTE or another employee, they would like to be able to go out and hire that. Well, uh, I think that's okay, but we've got to make sure they need that. Can I ask if the the proposals to lower the income tax are they still at play now? Well, I don't think on the Senate side they are. I think everybody understands that uh, we're going to have issues that are going to need to be taken care of and we're going to have to use the resources we have. I think there are some that uh, still think they are in play. But keep in mind that we have cut income tax the last three bienniums. The income tax in North Dakota is very low. We do not have a high income tax. And so if we can do something for the taxpayers in the way of 
property taxes, I think that's the place to go right now. And not to put too fine a point on that, that's the one tax everybody says, everybody complains about. It is, and I, I you know, it is a, it is a local tax. It really isn't a state tax, but the state has been brought into the debate, and so we uh, were there too. Very briefly, um, there's been some talk about reserving some time at the end of the session. Maybe go 75 days and hold five days for any special session or any veto uh, re reconsideration session. Do you think that's possible? I do think it's possible, and we'll work very hard to get that done. I think I'd like to see us have six or seven days, but if we can get five days at the end so that if we ever have to call ourselves back in, we have that flexibility. And I know that uh, Representative Carlson is committed to that, too. Very good. Senator, thank you very much for the time today. Thank you. Our guest today on Legislative Review, Senate Majority Leader Rich Wardner, Republican from Dickinson. For Prairie Public, I'm Dave Thompson. <laughs>